there's a question that most everybody gets asked. And it's a question that can either be a really exciting question or a really discouraging question. Uh, probably every one of us has asked this question before, or maybe even been asked this question, that always happens right at the end of college. And it's, what are you doing after you graduate? You know, and some people are like, I'm so excited because I know exactly what I'm going to do, and other people are like, don't ask me the question because I have no idea. At the end of college, I loved that question because I knew exactly what I was doing. And so I was waiting for people to ask because I had an answer. And so I loved it when people asked. And so people asked, well, what are you doing after you graduate? And I said, I'm going on in school. I'm going to grad school. I'm going to seminary. I'm going into ministry because God's called me into ministry. So my dad and I took a trip in the fall of my senior year of college. And we went back to Princeton, New Jersey, and to Philadelphia to go look at two different seminaries that were the top two choices that I had. So we, we went back there, we went to Princeton, and we went to Westminster Seminary, and had a great time. You, know, you walk on those campuses, and they're the, the old East Coast-style campuses, and you feel like learning. You know, there's so much heritage there, and there's so much richness there, you just want to learn. And so when we were back there, I decided, well, those are definitely my top two choices. So we came back, and I applied around Christmas time and sent in my applications. And, you know, they tend to tell you in the springtime at some point. And they sent me letters back. And I didn't get into either one. And I thought, I, I probably shouldn't be telling you this, should I? <laughs> and I thought, what is going on? You know, I had the grades, I had the recommendations, I had the people saying, yes, this is for you. What is going on? And now I have no answer. I thought, all right, well, I guess I have to wait. So graduation happened, and I got an internship with a company uh, in town where we went to college. And it was a summer internship, which was a wonderful experience. And it turned into a job right after that summer, which was even better because then it allowed uh, me to stay, and Kimberly stayed in town, and we got to continue dating, and it was a great time to be able to grow in a mini career and try out graphic design and advertising and enjoy that, and it was a wonderful experience. I mean, I met so many great people and learned a lot and had some great business experience and encounters, and along the way, every now and then, I just kept thinking, God, what are you doing with this whole seminary thing that just never happened? And the only answer that I kept getting was, just wait, it's not time. So I kept on working, and we were involved in our church, and we were getting some wonderful experience there, learning some new things. And a few years later, Kimberly and I got married. And one of the decisions that we made when we got married was that we were going to make no major changes for one year. We weren't going to move. We weren't going to pursue school. We weren't going to do anything. We were going to be married and focus on being married. So we stayed at the jobs we had. We didn't move anywhere. And that made me wait another year. So during that year, we, we kept talking about, well, what's next? And this whole subject of seminary and ministry kept coming up. And we continued to talk and pray through this and wonder when. And uh, we started to get an answer that it was time. So we went uh, to a closer seminary. We went down to Pasadena to Fuller Seminary and realized how much of a fit that place was. And as I had changed and grown in my ministry perspective and different things, I realized that those other places that I had visited before that I didn't get into, they were not the right spot. So I applied, got in, we made plans to move, and we moved. Five years after I had first tried, and God just kept saying, it's not time yet. Just wait. The people in Jesus' day had been waiting for a Savior. And they hadn't just been waiting for five years. They'd been waiting for over 500 years. And during those hundreds and hundreds of years, their waiting had turned into this kind of frenzy 
I mean, there was so much buildup of anticipation about God's got to do this sometime. When is God going to do this? How is God going to do this? Who is this Savior? How is this going to work? And it all stemmed from these passages, way back in the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah said things like this. He said, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. Then you will rejoice before your, as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. For a child is born to us, the son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passion and commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. I mean, those are like fighting words. Those are charge words. And so people would repeat these generation after generation to each other as if to say, this is God's promise. God is going to do this. Keep watch. Keep waiting. It's going to happen. Just wait for it. So there was this buildup and anticipation to the point where people weren't, after a while, just waiting for you know, God's Savior or a Savior to come. They were waiting for the Savior, you know, capital S kind of Savior. They were, they were waiting for this thing that God was going to do that was the biggest thing ever. And there was so much that people were wanting out of this. And this is the waiting that Mark captures and taps into when he starts his biography of Jesus. See, we've been talking through this Advent season about the beginnings of the four biographies of Jesus. How did Matthew start? How did Mark start? How did Luke, how did John start their biography? Because it wasn't, none of them started with the birth of Jesus. You know, when we talk about somebody, we say, well, I was born in so-and-so place, and then I grew up. They didn't start with where Jesus was born. And if they didn't do that, then the way that they started has to be significant. Because it had to be better than Jesus being born. So what is it that they started with, and how does that help steer our attention during the season of Advent to Christ? So Mark's tapping into this frenzy, this excitement about what's going on. And how does Mark begin? Well, he begins by saying, this is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He has a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming! Clear the road for him! I mean, Mark is saying to these people who've been waiting for hundreds of years, the wait is finally over. Is anybody waiting for something right now? I mean, I'm sure we're waiting for, like, a package to arrive from Amazon. Or we're waiting for a friend to call us. We're waiting for a baby to be born. We're waiting, we're waiting for things. But are we also waiting for stuff? I mean, we're waiting for that person to change. We're waiting for resolution to happen. We're waiting for peace to come. We're waiting for health. We're waiting for healing. We're waiting for all kinds of stuff. God is a God who promises lots of stuff. And there's only one promise that I can find that God has ever made that God has not yet answered. And that's the promise that Jesus will come back. Because yeah. it hasn't happened yet. But every other promise that God has ever made, maybe God has said, wait a while, but it's happened. Mm -hmm. And Mark is saying, guess what, people? The wait, it's over. And is it fun to wait? No, it's horrible. I mean, waiting is awful. It's, it's awkward, and it's, it's uncomfortable, and it's frustrating. And we don't know when, and we don't know how, and we don't know where, and we don't know what we're supposed to do, and we don't know what they're supposed to do, and we don't know. Mark gives us, I think, the good news and the bad news about waiting. And the good news that he gives us about waiting 
is that there's a good side to it, that waiting is really wanting. It's wanting more. You know what I mean? Because when we're waiting, we're looking for something. We're wanting that more. We're knowing that something else is out there and we're waiting for it. The minute we stop waiting, we're not wanting anything. Because there's nothing that we're waiting for. But if we're waiting, then we want something more that God might be doing. And we're going to wait for that thing. So waiting, part of waiting is just wanting. And Mark has incredible news that this capital S Savior that God has promised, the wait is over. Because that Savior is coming. Now, here's the bad news. The bad news is that something has to happen before the waiting is really finally over. And the way that Mark talks about that is he brings this new guy on the scene, this John the Baptist guy. This is the quirky part of Mark. Because here's how Mark describes it. The messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. John announced, someone is coming who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And for sure, you know, John is, he's an odd duck. He's just not your typical guy. He stood out, for sure, from the rest. But Mark makes his job absolutely clear. And he makes his job clear by connecting it with Isaiah, how he started out just the first thing we read a minute ago. That he is the messenger who is ahead of you. He will prepare your way. He's the voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road. You know, John was that herald, the guy who was way out front announcing something that's going to happen, pulling people out of their houses, grabbing their attention, saying, pay attention, get ready, this thing is happening. And his message was as loud and clear as a message can be. I mean, his message, we just read it. It's on the screen. It's in your bulletin. His message was two things. Repent and be baptized. Now, when John was talking about repent, he was talking about getting rid of your sins, throwing them away, throwing them to the other side of the line. Literally, repent means to turn around, to go the other way, to do a 180, to do the opposite of what we've been doing that is not along God's will. So John is saying, whatever you're doing that is getting in the way of you seeing the fulfillment of what God is doing, turn away from it and go the other way and go toward God. And then when you do that, he says, be baptized. Now, talking about baptism in that day, those people, was either really awesome or totally offensive. Because to some people, baptism was an amazing thing. And to other people, they thought, I don't need to be baptized. Because who does John call to this conversation? Who does John say, come out of your houses, come hear this message? All the people of Judea, including all the people from Jerusalem. That includes the people who were the Jewish followers, who were obedient, and that includes the people who were not obedient and were far away from God. Now, to the Jewish people who heard this, they're saying, absolutely, we baptize people all the time. They would baptize as sort of a right of entry into the Jewish faith. So when somebody repented of their sins, they would baptize them to say, now you are part of this faith. That was that, that washing from head to toe. This is a sign that you are clean and that God is doing a work in your life. So the people who are not Jewish, who are not part of the family, they would be baptized, and they would celebrate it. But John is not just calling the outsiders to repent and be baptized. He's calling the insiders, too. And for them, they would have said, I don't need to be baptized. I was born into this. I don't need any way of getting in because I'm already in. So when John says, you need to, be repent, you need to repent and be baptized, they would say, Oh, no. And they were totally offended by that. 
what John is saying, God is doing such an incredible new work in this time, this season when the waiting is over. He's doing such a big new work that everybody, no matter where anybody is at or what anybody has done or not done, everybody needs to be as ready as we can be for God to do what God is doing. See, waiting is not just wanting. Waiting is working. I mean, it's working hard. And that's part of what Advent is. I mean, it's the season. We call it preparation. It's preparation for Jesus to come. And preparation is an okay word, because that's just sort of stuff to do. But working hard, that's a whole new level of getting ready for Jesus to come. I mean, that's repenting. That's turning the other way. That's showing and proving that we have turned from a way that is not a way of God. And to be ready, as ready as we can be, for God to come. So when those five years of waiting were finally up, and we moved down to Southern California and started attending, I started attending seminary. I suppose it's no surprise, but I was so ready. I was so excited. Whereas other people were complaining about having to write papers and read books, I was, I seriously, I was soaking it up because I was so ready. You know, because sometimes waiting makes you want more. And when we wait, sometimes we're just willing to work hard to see what God has in store. May our waiting produce that kind of wanting and that kind of willingness to work for what God has in store for us. Let's pray.